seconds. And that's the chime. It means it's the time for the Philanthropy Mastermind series, but today is a special one. Um, my name is Jay Frost. If you're new to this party, of course, this is the Philanthropy Mastermind series brought to you by Donor Search. Um, we may or may not be referencing them today. We have a really exceptional panel, and my role is to merely to get this, uh, this party underway so that it can then be led by uh, the incomparable Nathan Chappelle. But uh, before I provide those introductions, I want to welcome you here and encourage you to utilize a couple things we have here so you can be a part of this conversation, even though we cannot see or hear you. So the first of these, as you see, typically at the bottom of your screen will be the chat. If you'd please just take a minute to look down there or maybe look to the left or the right and let us know that you're here. I know that our panelists would really appreciate knowing where you're coming in from and uh, maybe which organization you're with. Uh, anything you want to say, feel free to use that as your sandbox. We will not be using that for the Q&A. Uh, questions should go over to the Q&A so that that way we won't miss anything brilliant that you have to say or any contributions you want to make. So use the chat for yourselves and also just to let us know that you're here, warm up the conversation and use Q&A please throughout where we'll store up those questions and then be able to address them later on in the presentation. Now today's presentation, as you know, uh, is a discussion and it's on that subject of promise and perils of chat GPT for the nonprofit sector. If you don't know what that is, stick around because you're going to want to know it's the probably the biggest influence uh, influencing factor in the conversation on nonprofits right now. And we've got several really brilliant people, leaders in the sector who can talk about this from a variety of perspectives. Um, the person who will be leading this session, of course, as I just mentioned, is Nathan Chappelle, who is the senior vice president of Donor Search AI, where he leads AI deployments of some of the nation's largest nonprofit organizations. You may or may not know Nathan's past work, so I'll just make a couple quick references. He's the author recently with a couple of co-authors, um, uh, uh, Brian Crimmins among them, of uh, The Generosity Crisis. If you don't have that on your shelf, please go get it after the session today. He founded Fundraising.ai as a member-centric collaboration of nonprofit professionals with a focus on data ethics, data quality, privacy, and security. So uh, that may be referenced today. And he's a member of the Forbes Technology Council, among other things. Uh, he'll be leading this discussion, but I'll just briefly provide an introduction to the others who are participants in it. They're all leaders in the field, and you may or may not know all that they have done to contribute to all the discussions we have in the field of fundraising and philanthropy. Um, these are, I think, in alphabetical order, uh, Starin Bird, uh, CFRE, Senior Director, Nonprofit Industry Advisor at Salesforce. She joined Salesforce in July of 2020 after spending 28 years in the nonprofit sector. She's a nationally recognized leader in the community uh, with, again, nearly three decades in service to philanthropy. Um, including a whole variety of organizations um, in the leadership roles, Duke Medicine, University of California, American Red Cross, March of Dimes, United Way. It's hard to go through them all, but also in several of the major leading consultancies in the country. Um, we also have with us Nishid Kasim, the, uh, among other things, uh, the CEO of Kila, uh, which is an impact technology company, which does quite a bit of work with AI. He's also the co-founder of Fundraising Kit, or KIT. I should have asked him if he uh, pronounces it as a word or just a, as an acronym. Um, he also is an attorney, uh, which makes his work very interesting because he's the founder of the public policy organizations, um, the Better Canada Initiative. Um, and he does a lot of work, of course, in nonprofit law throughout Canada and probably a little bit beyond. He's also the former executive director of both End Poverty Now and Conversations for Change and the author of the book, High on Life. We also have with us a good friend in the program and a friend to all of us in philanthropy, Barbara O'Reilly, CFRE, principal at Windmill Hill Consulting. She's also been in the field for over three decades, working with a variety of different functions in the sector from annual fund, major gifts, campaign fundraising, etc and has worked both within and as counsel to organizations including harvard national trust for historic preservation oxford university and the american red cross she's also a past president of i think the largest charity uh, uh, the largest chapter rather of the association of fundraising professionals the washington dc metro chapter of afp and is on the faculty of U uh, university of maryland's do good institute where she teaches nonprofit fundraising so with that i'm going to turn the baton over with pleasure to Nathan Chappelle. Nathan. Thank you so much, Jay. And it's so great to be here finally today. I know we, we've probably been bombarding you all on LinkedIn for quite a while now, and it really came out of just sheer enthusiasm for this conversation. Um, we are, I, I'm really, really excited about this conversation. Everyone on this panel um, are industry leaders in their own respective areas. And I think together, 
uh, we're, we're just really excited to come together and talk about a technology that is has changed everything. And so to just get things going, we want to start out with you know, kind of a test to see how nerdy the group is today. And we're really excited. We had over 500 people register for this. I assume that if you're on a panel or on a conversation, join a webinar about ChatGPT, there's at least a nerdy uh, part of you that um, is it wants to know more. And it's interesting because I think we see so many different levels of interest where uh, I had a conversation even with my dry cleaner a few weeks ago who asked what I did for a living. And and I said, well, I, you know, I work in AI and um, in the nonprofit sector. And he literally said, well, what's AI? Um, but then um, instantly asked me what I knew about this thing called ChatGPT. So someone that didn't even know that uh, what AI was had heard about ChatGPT and it led to a really interesting conversation. So I, I can imagine that on this call, we have a very broad spectrum of individuals that um, have heard about ChatGPT want to know a little bit more, and then specifically what we're going to do today is dive in um, into uh, what this means for our sector, both short term and, and long term. So I'm going to just advance a couple slides and get your uh, keyboards ready because we're going to see which of you is probably the nerdiest. Um, so if you know the answer to the to the question, um, which movie is this from, type it into the chat and uh, we'll give you a quick shout out. All right, so first one, I, I doubt there are probably anyone on this call that uh, doesn't know this, this one, but we're gonna start off with the softball. All right, Judy, great job. We got lots of lots of Star Wars, at least people, it, whether they're fans or they know what Star Wars is. So let's go down this list. This will only take a couple of minutes. This one uh, might, might uh, be a little harder, I'm not sure. All right, Terminator, Fran. Janelle, we got, okay, you're all familiar with Terminator, even though I haven't seen it for a while, classic. One of my favorites, and I, when I looked the other day, I think this came up as the number one uh, movie about AI. Um, I guess it depends on what poll you're looking at. Love this movie, all right. Maybe a little harder. Oh, wow, look at, man, okay, this is, like we are literally preaching to the right group here today. Like this is gonna be a great conversation. And with this, we want you to ask your questions um, throughout as Jay said, and we're gonna monitor those questions and react. Okay, so. Tron right away. All right, I actually rewatched both Trons this weekend in preparation for this uh, webinar. I wanted to make sure I was uh, really channeling my, my AI nerdiness here. Wow, okay, I thought this one would be a little trickier, the RoboCop right away. And I couldn't even see who came up with the first RoboCop. It's like the, the chat is just going too fast. Marissa and Claire and John, Jeff, awesome, all right. I binged AI movies this weekend. I also watched this one, so. Lots of war games. Okay, we've got, I think two more, three more. Space Odyssey, probably one of the most horrifying examples of AI you could possibly have being left out in space because your computer basically says you're a threat. Short Circuit, all right, you guys are like, this is like everyone's winning Jeopardy right now. Short Circuit, maybe a little harder. Chappie. Claire, I, I think I've seen Claire like number one on a couple of these. Well done, choppy, horrifying. This is what happens when there's an event in history that will be called singularity or general intelligence. When robots start to think for themselves, they'll instantly grab guns and you know march down the streets. All right, this one uh, might be a little more dated. Jeff got it, Westworld. Like you're almost like waiting for this, like you already knew the answers. Westworld, Charleston Heston, um, great, I mean, you know, great one to watch. And then of course there's the new series. And last one, my favorite, maybe a little harder, but one of the best examples of how AI goes, goes bad. Yes, okay, well, that doesn't make sense or it's not fair because my team answered Willy Wonka because I have signed autographed copies of Gene Wilder's um, 
picture on my wall here. So they already knew that. No minority report, no X, I never know how to pronounce that. It's Makina, is that right? Okay, I'll let you pronounce it, Najib. Um, always a also a horrifying movie. Um, her also, they're great. There's a lot of great AI movies. One of my favorite, actually, I told Barbara this weekend, um, she put on LinkedIn Desk Set, uh, Audrey Hepburn. Um, and it was, it was such a good movie with Emmerich, the machine that was replacing humans. So, all right. So as we dive into this today, great job, everyone. Ghost in the Shell, so many. As, as we dive into this today, and I was sharing with the group right before we started, that um, as a essentially a self-proclaimed technologist, I've always just really been a, you know an early adopter and looking forward to new things, and also skeptical about technologies that are truly transformative. When ChatGPT came out, of course, I've known about GPT three for a long time. You know, the technology is not new, but I was fairly skeptical. Um, and then instantly, when I used it, I was instantly impressed. And we're going to talk more about that today. But I thought, you know, if we're going to do this session. Um, and we're going to call it, you know, the promise and perils of using ChatGPT for the nonprofit sector. What would ChatGPT say about this? And so I asked it, and we have a 40-second little video of that we're going to uh, analyze here. The promise of using ChatGPT in the nonprofit sector lies in the ability to automate, scale, and communication customer service operations. I'm not going to read this all. Talks about making. Uh, things more convenient and accessible to engage. And then it starts talking about the perils aspect of it. I'm using ChatGPT and uh, things like privacy and security and um, false information and stereotyping. And these are not insignificant things. So if you haven't used ChatGPT, that's what it looks like. You can just go on the website. It's free as long as it has um, has space to be used during the day. It's actually very easy to use at nighttime or weekends now because ChatGPT went is the fastest scale of any technology that they know of in terms of users, went from zero to 100 million users in about two months. Um, so we're talking about technology that has really taking, taken the, you know, the imagination of individuals by storm uh, to the point where Google had a uh, flag chat GPT as a red flag internally. And there was a letter from their CEO last week talking about this. We, had, we see this technology as changing everything. Um, we see it as being truly a formative technology that Bill Gates, in fact, about two weeks ago, equated this to um, the differences between the internet browser, the iPhone and chat GPT. So we're excited to be here today, really at this point, having a conversation about something that's as formative as the internet browser or as the iPhone. This is something that uh, is not going away. And ChatGPT is just one of many uh, applications that will do very similar things. In fact, Google will release its version of ChatGPT in a few weeks called BARD. And, um, and is having some challenges with it. In fact, uh, they released a commercial with it a few, I don't know, two weeks ago where it gave a wrong answer about the James Webb telescope and their stock value went down $100 billion in one day because of their wrong answer of something that it should have known better. But again, this is something that we are all going to be faced with, faced with in, and be using quite extensively. Um, GPT is essentially a, a technology that uses lots and lots and lots and lots of data and essentially just goes and tries to predict what the next answer. If you write a question, it will try to predict what word comes next. So we won't go too much in the details today. In our second session on this, we'll dive a little bit more into how large langu language models are used and where this technology is going. At the end of the day, um, I think most people that have used ChatGPT have seen a lot of promise in the technology, have seen how it can create a lot of efficiency, but there's also quite a few challenges with it too. When I posted on LinkedIn, um, I'm just going to read a couple of the responses that we got that really led to this panel today. One of the responses was, um, and I think the prompt was, um, is sounding authentic or, or being sounding authentic the same as being authentic? And it sparked a lot of conversation. Uh, someone wrote, on LinkedIn, as, as a technology professional, I have reservations about AI in the workplace, but after using ChatGPT for a few days, my point of view is shifting for being for it. So not just ChatGPT, but for AI in the workforce. 
another person we had a really great conversation with, which was, um, I honestly don't see any moral issue in using ChatGPT or any AI for that matter, as long as it's benefiting those in need. So this moral imperative does does the the downside of this technology, even if it's around trust or transparency, does it outweigh the um, the the benefits of it if you're helping humanity? And then of course, you know, not that Bill Gates responded to my LinkedIn, that would be the day. Um, but he talked about this being the most highly baited technology of the year, uh, which no doubt it will be um, as we see more and, and more come out. I'm gonna stop actually sharing my screen and just dive in. I was like so hesitant, I don't wanna like close down the, the webinar there. Um, and so just start with our conversation. So um, again, Jay did such a great job of teeing up our industry or our panel today to have a really organic, authentic conversation about, about the promise and perils of ChatGPT. Is this rainbows and sunshine, uh, or is this something that we have to um, wade with caution? And are there areas that we could see, you know, literal transformation in the nonprofit sector, or is this just a fad and something that you know is going to pass as as time goes on? So, um, the panel today has all agreed to, um, you know, agreed that we don't know all the answers, um, and that we want to just discuss um, some of these with you. And then, of course, as you have questions, please let us know so that we can um, weave those questions into the chat as well. So um, I, I wrote enough to cover an hour session uh, on my own, which I don't, I'm not going to do, but we're gonna just dive in and, and really talk about um, the heart of the issue here. And so um, I'll start out with um, Barbara. And Barbara, I think I wanna start with you because I think your uh, take on this is, I think not to speak for you, but a, if you consider yourself a technologist or non-technologist, but how you've equated this technology online into things like the Jetsons or into some of the movies that you reference. So I'm um, I'm curious, and I actually want to ask the whole panel this, um, but we'll start with you, Barbara. Um, your experience with AI in your personal and professional lives, like, do you consider yourself someone that looks for new technology? Are you an early adopter or a late adopter? Do you wait until stuff is proven or do you just jump into it? Yeah, so I'm usually um, uh, a late adopter. So that's why I um, I feel like even just amongst all of you um, uh, experts uh, and technologists that I'm sort of the Luddite of the group. Um, I held on to my BlackBerry for far too long before and, and then eventually switched to an iPhone, right? Because I was like, I don't want all this tech on my in my hands. Um, and now I'm using it to do online banking, to Venmo people, to do, and you know, it's in my car, and it it knows when I'm when I'm getting in the car, and giving me directions, and I mean, it's doing everything, right? Check its emails and text everything. So I I think um, so while I'm normally a late adopter for this, when I for ChatGPT, when I started seeing so much buzz about it over the last month or two, um, and I especially saw a lot of reactions to it to you know in terms of uh what does this mean for fundraising what does this mean for nonprofits how is how does this um contribute to or deter from the donor experience and the way we engage with our donors and supporters um i i got really curious pretty quickly um and so that's i and in just doing you know my own personal usage of it over the last you know, month or so playing around and seeing what it could do. It's fascinating to me. And I think it it has, a it, it will, as we were talking before that we went live, it will have a role for sure, whether we like it or not. And so um, we see it now. I mean, we use data analytics to be really refined in how we do segmentation and identifying where our best opportunities are within our donor files, right? And that was when I started 30 years ago, we were doing segmentation based on giving levels, right? Zero to 500, 500 to 1,000, right? And so uh, it, we're so much more refined and we use AI in a lots of different ways that we don't even realize we're using nowadays. So even as a, a late adopter, you're seeing this as something that is formative, um, that 100%. should be should be maybe not going away right away or something that could is actually going to change business. 
Yeah, and I don't think we should be railing against it so quickly either. So I think we we have to see how it can be used in a way that's going to be best serving our our organizations, our staff, and um, and our sector as a whole. Yeah, we'll definitely dive into that too. I want to spend some time with this group talking about how do you evaluate, you know, the good and bad uh, portions of this, like what what actually provide short-term benefits versus long-term harm uh, to the nonprofit sector. So Najib, um, I, well, I mean, I don't want to assume, I assume you're an early adopter given that you uh, have started, you know, a few tech companies and, you know, kind of see the future there, but um, what was your thought on this? I mean, I, I imagine that you. So, so it's interesting of... that you make that assumption, Nathan, because there is, I take my notes with a fountain pen on my desk. So <laughs> I am, so, well, and that's not a prop. Like there's just a, like it's actually so um i think for me you know i feel like the luddite of my entire generation i'm an elder millennial so i'm sort of in this funny stage where i remember when technology wasn't didn't play the same role i also barbara held onto my blackberry like it was my wife you know like it was just, i refused to give it up finally i did um but where i see the up you know what i wish i'd known about early Google or mm -hmm. early BlackBerry or whatever was just, there are some things that, that have an opportunity to transform actually how we work, how we live, how we think. Um, and I'm not saying chat GPT is one of them, but it certainly has the prospect of being one of them. Mm -hmm. I think that like kind of, I didn't know Bill Gates said that, but now I feel a little bit smarter that I thought the same thing <laughs> because, you know, to me, there are these inflection points in our history, right? And and this could be one of them. And because of that, I feel excitement. You know, Barbara, to your point, we build a lot of the technology that you folks use in fundraising around AI, around predictive analytics, around segmentation. That's and I remember when I first heard that idea, it was actually, I was like in the shower. I have a notepad in my shower because I'm a crazy person. And um, I remember thinking, damn, we could do that in fundraising and it could just help us it was really about empowering the fundraiser. So it wasn't, you know, there's a ton of data. There have been a ton of books written about how fundraisers, there's a level of toxicity. Fundraisers are exhausted. There's burnout. Like how can predictive analytics or in this case, something like Chat GPT help us with that? That's where I see the promise in our sector. And that's why I'm an early adopter for, for, for our work. Does awesome. that answer your question, Nathan? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's great. I mean, I, it surprised me a little bit and I'm like, you know, I mean, I think that's so representative of, you know, those joining this webinar and those that I've had conversations with are like, well, it, it, some, something about this technology has captured people's attention far faster um, to a, level, a greater level of detail than so many technologies that just come and go. Nathan, right? I'm going to add, I think it's also captured people's imagination. So it's not just their attention. I think that imagine it, it's, it's, there's, and that's, to your point, very yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, as soon as, you know, Barbara goes to the Jetsons, you know, then you actually look and if you research, like, how many things did the Jetsons, um, did they project would happen? And and I forget, it's it's still, it was like 100 years out, right? So it's like 2060 or something like that. How many of those technologies already exist today, like the smartwatches and the, you know, the I want my jetpack. That's the one thing I'm waiting for. Like, I don't you know, I don't know Barbara, but I want my jetpack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, so much of this is like, okay, there's a, this is a Jetsons moment for me. Like mm -hmm. ChatGPT is like, we, to Barbara's point, we've been working with alongside AI a lot, right? Mm -hmm. It tells us where to go and how to go and the fastest way to get somewhere. But there's not been that, that two-way interaction with AI that we are seeing with, with ChatGPT, like, oh, like I'm conversing now, not with just like a Siri telling me the weather, I'm and now it's going to talk to me, I bet. But um, <laughs> but actually, like asking it very complex questions. And Staren was sharing an example before we got on the call about just super obscure questions like that. I don't even know where you would go in the past. Like they would probably be questions that go unanswered because honestly, they take eight hours to investigate on your own. Now, all of a sudden, it's at your fingertips. And uh, we'll talk about the precautions with some of that in the in later. But um, so Staren, early adopter, late adopter, somewhere in between. Where are you at on this poll? I, I would say that just chronologically based on um, where I am in my life, I'm probably a late adopter. Um, however, I guess I think when I think about this, I think about the word curiosity, 
So in much the same way that I believe curiosity is the antidote to fear, I also think that curiosity um, really births most innovations. And so the idea that um, we can all get curious about this, just like we get curious about back in the day segmentation or analytics or um, you know, actionable insights as we really come to learn and understand our data sets, I think, I think that's a very real thing. Where I um, come down on this particular technology and am, again, to use my own words, really curious about it, I want us to be sure that we as a human race <laughs> continue to discern and put heart first um, motions and interactions with our donors and with our supporters at the forefront of what we're doing. So while I can see practical applicability for using chat GPT around aggregating data around a particular person's interaction with an organization and, de and delivering a draft of an impact report, for mm -hmm. example, I would hope that we would continue to also put a human overlay on that and double, triple, and quadruple check it. And moreover, I would hope we would deliver said impact report personally, because I think at the end of the day for me, um, and I beat this drum all day, every day, that at the heart of philanthropy is people. And right. so if we you know, while I believe in innovation, obviously, I mean, I, I've as a late adopter and in, in what I do in my work now, I think we need to really remember and stay grounded in what it means to be in the nonprofit sector and to hold space for communities and then figure out how to leverage this in support of the ultimate goal, which is to make sure that the world is a better place. So would you say it's curiosity with, with, um, some sort of balance or, you know, curiosity, but not just jumping in the deep end of the pool without Absolutely. questioning, right? Yeah. And, well, and I think- I have oh, two, yeah. sorry, go ahead, no, Nathan, please. No, 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 please. I, I think Staren's absolutely right. And I think there's two things that we have to think about. Maybe this is the lawyer in me designing process, but this is, there is, every organization is gonna have to take a sober look at how we use this technology and create a set of guidelines internally, you know, is it that we deliver impact reports personally to your point, Darren? Is it that we have to, that nothing can be written by a technology like this without being proofread by a human? Is it, you know, is, is it that we make sure that we're, you know, don't forget when you read this to look at lenses of equity, look at lenses of, you know, this and that or bias or whatever. Like, I think the guideline, the devil's always in the details and the, and the, mm. the details in this are going to be the application of it, not the technology itself. That's my, my first kind of comment on, on what Staren said. And again, I really agree. The second one, I think is like, you use the perfect word. It's about draft. The mm. word, like, I think that's really powerful. I've written a couple of books and the worst feeling in the world is that first blank page. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I've done it thousands of hours, right? And if something like this can help you and you've got that ethical framework, it can solve that first push the boulder down the, the hill you still have to do stuff to it. You have to write, rewrite, re re rewrite, re edit, et cetera. But there's some, there's some, I think the, the word draft is so powerful in this because it, and it kind of goes to a question I know you're going to ask is like the replacement factor. And is that going to, and we'll talk about that later, but I really love staring how you talked about draft because there's, there's, a, I think there's a lot of power to that. And I also don't want us as a, I mean, I don't mean to be wax philosophical here and get overly, so you know, far. dramatic about it, but I mean, it's me. Hello. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we have to remember that discernment and <clears throat> the, you know, new ideas and connecting tissue or drawing parallels between points in history and moments in time that we're in now is also a very human interaction. And I might also say, and this is the mother of two teenagers saying, that I also think it's an important muscle for us to flex as human beings that we cannot 
begin to rely on other forms of technology in service of speed at, at our own peril if we are not discerning and yeah. thinking about things and, and really developing you know head and heart first opinions yeah. about things sure use it as a tool that's how i see it but I, I don't think we can, I, that's where the peril comes in for me is, you know, how do we balance the peril of relying on something that, you know, that's because we're, we're not replaceable as, as a human race, I don't think. Yeah, I 100% agree, Sarah. And, and I, and I, that's where I think, all, uh, although I would typically be a late adopter, in this case, it is, it can be a really important and uh, useful tool to for overstretched bandwidth, right? To your point, Najid, about um, fundraisers being pulled in lots of different directions. Um, and, and so in that way, I feel like it, it can help and improve uh, efficiencies, perhaps maybe improve that process a little bit, but it can't ever remove it, it replace the, the human discernment, the, that, you know, that the nuances of how human fundraisers are looking at what's the right series of communications that we need to create to engage our first time supporters or those who have become inactive? How do we, how do we and bring them back uh, or try to bring them back? How do we write an impact report or some other um, grant report that really is um, uh, as best reflective of the organization of that donor support of collective the collective power philanthropy and those are things that that chat GPT can't do so you know maybe getting started with something right to the to the point of not having to stare at a blank page but then bringing in that human element of those nuances that only human beings can discern I think is where the power of the tool comes into play well you what you're reminding me of Barbara is what I what I was imagining is that imagine, you know, as all of our NGOs move towards connected data sets, right? So they're, mm -hmm. they're really, we're really finally as a sector learning what it means to harness the power of the data we have in disparate silos, right? So imagine I can remember writing thank you notes or even appeal letters where I was trying to figure out how or where a particular individual had inter had interacted with my organization. And it might take me two days and a walk around campus to figure yeah. that out. Yes. You know, were it that you have a connected data set in, in an enterprise or, you know, or a global NGO, and you can actually aggregate that and then ask it to, be, mm -hmm. to begin to write that thank you note and then, or that impact report that draws upon all of those disparate interactions that said individual has had with your organization globally. What a powerful way to do that quickly and then overlay the human element and really mm -hmm. personalize it. So back when we used to write a canned letter and write on the side yeah. of the letter, thank yeah. you, Mr. Thank you, Nathan, for your wonderful support. It was great to see you at the cocktail party last week we can aggregate data in a whole new way and pull out a really meaningful narrative. And then addition, and, and even addition to that, it will be accurate. <laughs> it will be double checked and it can also be personalized. So, I mean, that's, that's a very basic example, but that's one yeah. that I get excited about. So mm -hmm. Barbara said something that was really interesting to me and, she, and you didn't use this word, but like so much of, fundraising is instinct based and it should mm -hmm. be data informed and like I'm with staring it needs to be data informed it needs to be uh -huh. there needs there's a whole bunch of things like environment political climate the stock market yeah. past interactions all that connected data I'm 100% on board with staring but you can't replace instinct and mm -hmm. if you and because instinct is I think is fundamentally human right it's based on empathy it's based on things that I can't even describe I have a whole room of engineers and none of them could code instinct for me. I promise you, like, I think I might've asked them once to try. And the point that I make with that is like, and I think that's where fundraisers were, we're also not salespeople in the same way as like, mm -hmm. you know, a tech company has salespeople, that relationship, that humanness of giving, because giving is such a personal thing. The instinct is going to inform the work and then whatever technology stacks we choose from predictive analytics to chat GPT mm -hmm. to everything in between is going yeah. to almost like operationalize those things. Yeah. So I think there's, it's not just like a, is it or isn't it? There's layers to this that I think are quite yeah. important for us to- and and It might say, even enable more human interaction because- Absolutely, exactly. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And, 
And this conversation is so, it's, it's not insignificant because, it, you know, I going back to the recording of the, of what ChatGPT kind of said its promise and perils were, you know, the first, the promise is really about an efficiency to like get you that first draft to like get you started or off a creative hump or whatever. The, the perils though, when I bucketed them um, in general forms like stereotypes and um, privacy and security and spreading misinformation, trust, trust, and trust, yeah. all three of which are imperative in the nonprofit sector. They're, they're, they are the nonprofit sector. So this is where I, I see the promise and perils of ChatGPT in the private sector being very different than the nonprofit sector, because you can think about things like, you know, privacy and security or misinformation in the private sector and be like, oh yeah, well, that's going to take a hit on someone's stock price or, you know, it's it just, maybe it's not going to make a, a big of a difference. In the nonprofit sector, trust is, is the currency that we work in. And so my concern all, you know, from the very beginning of ChatGPT, here's this really powerful tool that can do all the things that we've been talking about. And really, I mean, you know, talk about efficiency, like versus that, you know, two days kind of room, you know, thinking about, well, how am I going to start this thing, you know, having it get you started is just someone that pushes a button and says, all right, I'm done. Like, here's a letter to a donor and, you know, and it's just. But, but I think, Nathan, done. they're not. I think the whole point is that they're not done. I think like we can't. Right. And I think that's the difference. Maybe in the corporate world or whatever it might be, they can do that. I program something and it's done. I think in our world, and, and I speak not as a tech person right now, but as someone who spent 30 years in the nonprofit sector, you can't be done because that's always the opening salvo, not the end right. one, right? And I think exactly. because yeah. that those human relationships can't be, rep like it, it's not a transaction. Fundraising in, inherently isn't a transaction, unlike so many other kinds of human communication. I wanted to pick up on something you talked about, a currency of trust, because trust is something that's built. It's right. like a bank account of something that we build with organizations, with people, with fundraisers. And you can't really draw, like no technology can actually draw on that bank account. And that's why I talk about instinct or somebody wrote intuition in the chat or, you know, the, and I think accessing that bank account is something that no technology can do, but that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's what insulates and empowers fundraisers, right? Because that's the secret sauce that they're going to need to use in the context of these technologies, which brings us to like a really important topic that nobody talks about. It's like, which is who's training and teaching and engaging folks like fundraisers in mm -hmm. using this technology? Because the right. teachers, as right. I speak to a number of people who teach fundraising, uh, you know, are going to be so valuable in how we actually apply this. And so bringing the teachers on board, but also engaging them in these conversations is going to be vital for, for, for so many have a, ripple effects, I mean, of, of what happens yeah. and how it's used. And I think that's an important point. Yeah. Well, I, I would argue too um, that the sector in terms of, adopt, I mean, we have been woefully slow to adopt new technology and the forcing function. And part of why I ended up in the role that I'm in now really was largely three years ago when we were locked down. I mean, there were organizations walking towards innovation previously, make no mistake, and some doing it quite well. But then there were many that were forced. It was a forcing function. And I think to your point about teaching, you know, you often grew up, at least I will speak for myself, you grow up in the nonprofit sector as a fundraiser and you there's intuition and there's there's ability, <clears throat> but you are not taught really what to do with all of the data you are collecting and how to read and look at those analytics. And so that is still true of of data and much of the analytics. I mean, we've gotten incredibly, I mean, we've probably leaped forward a decade in three years, would be my guess. And now here we are with an, yet another new technology. So that the notion of upskilling and reskilling and really holding space for fundraisers and nonprofit leaders to learn, I think is is a very important point with this because you know there we're so resource constrained and what by that I mean not just money I mean time, mm -hmm. and being being able to find ways and spaces for these leaders to really learn how to leverage the power of these tools is critical for their adoption and then ultimately for their success. And, and I think doing that in a responsible way, I'm sorry, Barbara, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, speak in a responsible way. And this is where I think, um, to your point, 
you know, having the nonprofit sector be a bit slow to adopt and then to see such a, a like a gravitational pull to chat GPT mm -hmm. of like, this is what we're going to do to automate, you know, all of our letters now and, and segment them and, and without thinking about, well, what are the long term implications of that, right? I mean, because this idea that, and, and I tend to put on the hat of the 51% of Americans that don't give. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like we can think about how we can use this tool to to better communicate quicker, faster, more in a per personalized ways with those that donate. But if you put on the hat of the individuals that don't give the 51 percent of Americans that don't give to charity, they're not giving because they feel that sometimes giving could be manipulative or that it's it's not authentic. It's um, it's just transactional. And I think there's a real risk with ChatGPT of it even reinforcing that transaction. Because it's like it's like buying someone a greeting card and then pretending that you wrote it. I didn't write the greeting card; I gave it to you. But if we're passing on a letter from Chat GPT that we're pretending is ours and it's not, it will be felt. I mean, Najid talked about this as well, and Saren like it. There's a that that intuitive piece of the authenticity. You can tell if something's written for you or if it was is written but that line is being very it's getting blurry more blurry more blurry in fact the next version of chat gpt you know right now it's built on a an older version two you know two year old essentially model that the somewhere the prediction is about 50 to 100 times times the number of parameters will be in the next version it'll come out this year there'll be a a, a point very quickly where ChatGPT will sound so intuitive that it'll be hard to determine whether it was written by a robot or a person. What's our ethical responsibility to say, this is not written by me or, or how is, it, uh, I, I don't know the answers to this, but like, how do we do this so that the person on the outside doesn't feel like you're just having robots write these things and you really don't care about me. So we're actually reinforcing what their biggest fear is to begin with. Well, that that might be an entire new category in the Edelman Trust Report. If I mean, a few years yeah. from now, right? I mean, relative to something like this. Yeah. So, so. And well, Barbara, interesting. I saw. So no, 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 Barbara, you have more than waited. Sorry. Oh no, no, no. It's it's okay. Um, I well, um, I was gonna, I was gonna follow up on what um Starin had talked about before about uh and and Najid, how you um also both of you collectively said how do we how do we train or how do fundraisers and nonprofit leaders. Right. to take the time to learn this, but that could be a whole different discussion about the philosophy of professional development and learning and taking the time to invest in the tools um, that we that we need to be able to be more effective and efficient. So that that's a completely different, that could take us on a completely different tangent, which I won't go down right now. And, but And so, so important, our, our second session of the, this panel, we're going to talk more about how you create that framework. Part of that framework mm -hmm. is you know, how do you use it properly? How do you have safeguards around ensuring, you know, the accuracy and things like that? Because at, at the at the risk of, or the desire to do more and be more efficient, which every nonprofit should do, every company in the world should always try to become more efficient. Um, at, that, at that same time, like what is the risk of actually, you know, doing harm in our industry by exasperating kind of this this in unauthentic kind of way of fundraising that you know the the pendulum has swung so far to transactional philanthropy over the years this has the potential even pushing that pendulum even further which i you know it's it was kind of a little bit of a, a surprise there um the training aspect though i think is interesting because like prompt engineering is everything right so if you're with chat gpt if you've used it by now you've realized you know it's kind of garbage in garbage out really thinking through how you use a tool like this is a, it's a kind of an art um if you will if you at least in my opinion like of using it um you have to really be you have to almost be you know very thoughtful or trained on how to like query it to get mm -hmm. out of it what something that will be really beneficial i don't know if you've uh, had this Nathan, i just glanced over at the q a in the chat people are asking like for specific examples of how orange yeah. sector can use it so I'm happy to start that conversation. I, I, I like the idea of this first draft. So um, mm -hmm. one example that I saw was, you know, uh, you asked a piece of technology like this, can you please draft an email to a first draft? I always say first draft because I don't want it to be an email. I, so I'm going right. to say that again of, of an email, you know, sharing with a group of frequent donors, the opportunity to become a recurring donor and specifically about this campaign. 
So what it's going to do, it's going to spit out a draft of like, you know, whatever parameters you give it to, to your point, Nathan, about, about prompt engineering, right? Or another one is, can you create a, a, a three series drip about how, you know, the impact being made by our organization if you make a $50 donation? Mm -hmm. Or um, can you draft a, a social media, uh, uh, what's it called? A tweet for Giving Tuesday or a series of tweets leading up and it'll give you like 10 tweets with the appropriate hashtags and this and that. Um, those are some like very cursory examples, folks. So, so with it for this group, all three of you can answer this, uh, please do. Which areas within nonprofit philanthropy, if you will, I mean, you've got everything from, you know, fundraisers, like frontline fundraisers to, you know, stewardship people, communications people to um, grant writers, like where, where is this technology? Do you think it has the greatest promise um, where if you're in that, if you're in that field or that's your thing, like you need to double down your effort to learn more and, uh, and figure out how to put this to work. I, I think in the impact reporting space, um, mm -hmm. certainly in generating personalized, um, assuming that you have the data sets again, I I'm, I'm making gross assumptions here and Christian, I, I did see your chat in there in terms of practical practical uses, I would say that, you know, drafting impact reports, drafting, playing around with personalized thank you letters, playing around with um, the appeal piece of it. And actually, I would go so far as to say contextualizing your organization's impact historically against other organizations or other like work happening around the world. I would, I, I'm going to come back to my word curiosity, play around with it. You know, what if you said, um, you know, how does, you know, XYZ nonprofit um, measure or compare its work in the global South compared to how it does in North America? It will give you some information to think about and discern and in order for you to craft a richer mission and impact report. So hopefully that's a, that's just one idea off the top of my head. Yeah. And I would add to that. I think, you know, donor communications at large, I would even say, um, perhaps a little bit of prospect research, um, perhaps, right? It depends, um, again, how much will be accessible within the, the models, um, the language models that is accessing all the, the data sets. Um, I would say for sure the all the email, you know, the emails and the, the social posts, maybe even um, grant reports or proposals. Again, first drafts to get something on there, but I'm curious, though, from all of you, your perspectives, you know, is it, it will there be do you envision that there'll be a version of this that can be adaptable for nonprofits specifically? So, Stare and I was so thinking there isn't the version there already is. So I want to yeah. be clear, like that exists already. This is not there is a there are models specific to our sector who are trained specifically on sector data that are available to nonprofits. It's not chat GPT, but it's built on that open AI I think it's GP3, uh, three, three, I believe, no, three, three. Uh, yeah. three, that's already available. And there's, there's, and so, okay. you know, sorry, go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, no, no, please go ahead and finish. No. So like, it's not if there, there are availability and there are people using it and there are fundraisers essentially like giving you feedback. Cause that's the thing about, and, and I know Nathan, you're going to talk about this on the next version of this, but the more feedback that fundraisers give, the more right. input that specific right. to those fundraisers, specific models, we're actually going to, it's going to get better and better for our sector, right? That's how these massive um, models work. Sorry, go and, ahead, Barbara. And I was thinking more specifically to an organization. So for example, when they're pulling together an impact report, you know, back pre AI, the fundraisers and brand comms team members had to go to the program officers to find out, give me all the reports of the key things that we, we did as an organization globally, nationally in our communities. Uh, and so is there an opportunity then AI can be used within that one organization to say, pull all the key highlights that mm -hmm. we can do. So it isn't, I've got to meet with all these different program people or these field uh, reps or, you know. Well, whatever. actually, Barbara, that gave, one of the things that I love it for is summarization. So yeah. you write, copy and paste it. So, you know, a ton of stuff where it's like aggregate these data sources or, you know, reports, this, that. Yep. 
at some point, I don't think you can drag a PDF in there yet, but it's, we're coming, it's coming. Like that's relatively imminent. Right. So that I love, I love that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I see a couple of questions about the one for nonprofit, uh, Najid, you kind of sparked Mm -hmm. some interest. So, uh, Cherry and Koshi has created his, I'm sure this you're referring to the operating system, which is built on the older version of, of GPT-3. Um, but still what he's done is really fed mm-hmm. in lots of nonprofits speak to really help with that feature engineering, the, the prompt engineering to um, be a bit more tailored. And so we'll see a lot of uh, more of those, but right now any fundraiser can use even chat GPT for free yep. if mm-hmm. you can get on. In fact, I was going to show a live demo of it right now with Steren's prompt, but they're at capacity and which is truly <laughs> the most brilliant marketing strategy ever release something for free that trains the system while 100 million people are like, we're all the monkeys, like like typing in things that are training their AI. And then they come back two months later and it's like, oh, by the way, we're full. If you want unlimited access, pay us $20 a month. Yeah. Um, that's just the reality of it, you know, in right now. But for those that aren't as familiar, kind of on the backside, again, Google will have its own version. There'll be lots of versions of this. Um, yes, and there already are, by the way. Yeah. It's not so, just, ChatGPT is like the, the one in the news, but there are a ton of, yeah. models being built or you know it, it, this is yeah. the beginning like i think yeah. we all talked about this is the beginning right and, so. and katie just posted the reason why microsoft you know invested 10 billion dollars into open ai is that they're including chat gpt and bing yeah. google will have their own version because you know essentially search engines are no longer going to be you know what time is my movie you know i i think about the most difficult question i had to answer in grad school which is like the super obscure thing that took me like like a few weeks in the library and reading, I had to read books actually to like get answers for this question. ChatGPT could answer that within a few seconds. And so- But like, we haven't talked much about the perils, things. Nathan. And I know we've only got a few more minutes. Yeah. Sometimes it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Like that's sure. one of the things, right? Like, so, so, and that's why I like to use the term draft or, or, yes, or head start absolutely. or whatever, because mm-hmm. the data can be wrong and, and it, it doesn't think like a human. There's all these examples of, how it doesn't get math right or it can't make basic logical assumptions. And so again, treating this like the gospel, it is, it's not, it's not, it's not. what it is. And I think that's really sorry, Staring, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and Lindy in the chat brings up a really interesting point about privacy. And if you're using Chat GPT, perhaps in a closed data set in a particular NGO or organization to leverage it to do things mm-hmm. like generate thank you reports or impact reports at what point and and what are the conversations and I think this is yet to be determined like how is it that we are going to protect that privacy that all comes right back to the mm-hmm. trust and I don't think there's a clear answer for that yet Lindy um you know I think but it's a it's one that we have to raise up and I think that as you know, as nonprofit leaders, it's incumbent upon us to hold the line on that. And that's why these kinds of conversations are so important. So, well, which is also why we have to go back to what I said before: create organizational rules. How yeah. we should all have our own privacy policies, or you know, d- donor data statements, or whatever you want to call them. But you know, and obviously now I will put my tech company hat on. Make sure that the folks that you're working with, that you're partnering with, treat your data as seriously as you do. Um, And and I'm not saying one or the other. I mean, I'll, I'll, but for us, I can speak to being a lawyer, that is like non negotiable. You know, it's non negotiable. And I think whoever you're working with, make sure that it's also non negotiable for them. And that's not anything to do with me. I think that's a requirement for every organization. So, Oh, Barbara, say, uh, uh, go ahead and answer or, or um, share. Um, and then, well, I have to ask one last question because we can't dance around it anymore. No, 100%. So, uh, but I think I think these, this point about privacy is, is absolutely worth noting because we know that the more prompts we put into ChatGPT is going into, it's, it's training the machine, right? So it's going out there. So it's, um, and so the more that's coming back, it's it's still now putting um, uh, risk at if we're if we're going to be. So I when I said before about you know maybe doing prospect research uh, with all of the big asterisks around maybe because that that's going to put more information out there which could potentially threaten the, the privacy uh, that we hold so dear for our donor data. So and especially as privacy rules are going to be put more into effect. Uh, more across this country, 
we have to be really mindful of that, of that protection of the donor information. So important. So important. I mean, in the nonprofit sector, more important than any other area. I mean, again, because, mm -hmm. you know, one organization has, you know, a pretty significant breach. It affects every not the trust in every nonprofit yes. organization. You know, it's not just, you know, one corporation stock price that goes down. All right. So um, we have so many, we could talk for a couple hours, clearly a few hours and, and still not be done. Um, in, in terms of, you know, people wanting to learn more. Uh, there are obviously lots of YouTube videos on how to use ChatGP for different things. I mean, it's really that idea of, um, you know, question, you know, uh, prompt engineering. Um, but also, this is brand new. So like, this session is created just to like, start to dive in and for us to learn, you know, from each other. The question that we can't dance around anymore, and I definitely wanted to get to is, is this going to replace jobs in the nonprofit sector? Is this going to displace people or is this going to elevate what we do? And, um, and is that uniform or is it, or, or is, are there certain jobs that are at risk? Who wants to go first? I won't call on anyone. I, I would just, my quick response to that is that I don't know that it will replace. I think it will um, change some of the jobs, yeah. particularly in our sector. I can't speak for the private sector and other applications for this, but again, I'm gonna come back to my, my universal thesis and the drum that I beat all day, every day. This is, the industry we're in is a human industry mm -hmm. and it will always be so. And so I just think that this is a tool. And again, it's incumbent upon us to learn how to use it and leverage it to um, get more resources moving and help more people and hold up more communities around the world. I think it's just gonna change the work, not necessarily replace the people. And so, oh, sorry, Barbara, go ahead, please. No, no, go ahead, Najib, go ahead. I'm gonna really echo, staring what you said, there's a cliche somewhere on some LinkedIn that said, you're not going to be replaced by some, by chat GPT. Someone using it might replace you. Right. And while True. that may be overstated yeah. in and of itself, yeah. I think the point that Starin's making is it's, you know, there are, I guess I'm the one using a fountain pen, so I should be careful. But, you know, if people don't change, if we're still using typewriters, that's not saying don't type, you know, it's just don't use a computer instead of a typewriter, right? Like we have to evolve and, the ro role of people working in organizations is going to change it. And, and I think for the better overall, you know, it's going to be people thinking, it's going to be people creating more stronger relationships. It's going to be people getting on the phone. I think we all forget sometimes how powerful the telephone is in fundraising and no chat GPT or robot or robocall can actually do that. So I think how resources are going to be distributed is going to be changed, I think is, is a really, you know, kind of simple way to put it. But Absolutely not. Some people might lose their jobs and other people might get hired in lieu of that because, which will happen only if they don't grow, if they don't learn, if they don't adapt. But no, it's not going to replace fundraisers. I, I think hard no. Sorry, Barbara. Yeah, no, Barbara. and I'm also found pen writer. So uh, thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah, I completely agree. I think, what, what do I say? Plus two, right, to both of your comments. Um, I, I mean, think about uh, the very early day. I mean, when I started out in this business as a baby fundraiser, I would go down to the research department to talk to the researcher, to get the paper files. They'd be, you know, pouring over the papers and all the publications and doing clippings, literal clippings from the bright. And did that did that do 30 years later with all the tech tools at our fingertips and all that we can find on the internet has that replaced researchers no prospect researchers still exist right they still have they have different tools they're able to find different information and aggregate it in different ways so i think i agree with both of you that it's going to just change some of some of the jobs but it will also make some positions a little bit more efficient um, and, and easier and uh, and hopefully not have uh, not overstretch already overstretch bandwidth. The lesson there is, I mean, I think Najee, that you said it best, and I think, and I've heard this in the tech sector as well. It's like you know, um, you're if you're you basically if you're not using AI, you're going to be replaced by managers that are. Yeah. And there are some jobs that if your if your role is in you know in communications or answering questions or anything related to just really non just human to human interaction. You have to run, don't walk. This is not going away. And essentially, I think what we'll see is a really uh, an elevation of individuals that are, are using this 
and it will it won't be something that you'll be able to hide from. So I, I definitely think if you do not want to be, you know, obsolete, putting your hand, head in the sand is not going to be a, an option here. And so um, I know we're at time. I want to do a quick plug. This is an incredible, like, like let's set the stage for ChatGPT. It's something that clearly is not a fad that we need to pay attention to. Our second session is going to talk more about the digital divide. Um, it's going to talk more about whether or not it's even practical to think about a framework that could be established for responsible use of ChatGPT or models like ChatGPT in the nonprofit sector and go a bit deeper. And then our third session is going to be literally like a view from the field. So actual practitioners in the field representing different sectors, using it effectively in different ways um, and what's going well and what's not going well. And so I can't thank you enough. Jay, you're back. Uh, which means we're at time. So thank you for uh, patiently waiting. But, um, you know, my heart to all of you for being on this panel and allowing for this really organic conversation. And we look forward to to continuing the conversation over time. Yes, I didn't I have to say, time you know, this was, sorry, Jay, I was going to say, we have to say, this was so good that Jay didn't have to prompt us. This is the first <laughs> mastermind where sure. he didn't have to do, it was incredible. So um, he couldn't sorry. fit his way in, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I yes, I am. I'm not meaning to call time, but I do know that uh, that people will be rotating off, and I hope that they'll make two marks on their calendar before they do. The first is for March 23rd, which is this next session that Nathan just mentioned. Uh, that that will be with another panel um, on some of these issues. So I hope you mark that down in your calendar. That's March 23rd at 2 p.m. Uh, so there will be a description of that coming out soon. If you haven't received an invitation about this one, that means you're not on the list. So I hope you'll go over to donor search and check that out. Look at the resources tab where all, all the past masterminds programs have been, as well as the ones coming up like that one on March 23rd. And in addition, we do have kind of a preview for how people are using uh, chat GPT in real time for development functions, the kinds that we were just discussing now. That's with Gail Roberts, who's the chief development officer at Larkin Street Youth Services. She'll be doing a session tomorrow uh, at um, that's February 16th. Uh, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and that's on accelerating and maximizing fundraising with ChatGPT, showing how she has gone in and created everything from proposals to annual fundraising plans to capital campaign materials and shown them to her board exactly how she did it, what came out as a result. That's all tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. And like everything else in this series, it's all non-commercial and it's free. And we're so grateful that she, but especially this panel today, were willing to give their time, their talent, and this incredible expertise to share on this really important topic. So please do be a part of this conversation further by going to donorsearch.net, looking at the resources tab, signing up for the next sessions. Uh, and until then, um, again, my thanks added to Nathan's for everybody. Thank here. you all. You're the best. And thanks for everyone for joining us. And again, thanks for all the the, the work that you do to, to make the world a better place. There's a lot of other things you could be doing in this time other than thinking about how to increase generosity and and talk about the great work that nonprofits do thank you all this was great thanks thank folks you. really appreciate you all this Take was care. fun